You know, if you're watching today on Facebook or YouTube or any of those other 27 channels that Brandon's got us hooked up with, I want to welcome you. It's almost like you're here. The only thing that you need to do, I don't even know a good way for you to let me know you're here, but I'd just love to hear from you. So my information was up on the board. I don't know if you could see it or not, but it's just Ken at CollegiateMinistry.com. And I would love for you to just drop me an email sometime. Just say, by the way, your coat was funny or something, but just let me know that you were here. One of the things I get to do that is such a fun part of being a college minister, working with a bunch of young adults, is they are in that time of life, and it's today's Valentine's Day, so it's appropriate for me to talk about love and marriage and all this kind of stuff. And so I get a young couple that comes wandering in and says, Ken, would you? And I'm like, yeah, 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 because I'm anticipating and I'm anxious and excited. Would you do our wedding? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you sit with me through premarital counseling? And they're like, yeah, we kind of figured that was coming. (laughs) Today is the premarital counseling of chapters 7 and 8. Let me explain this a little bit. These are two chapters in the book of Zechariah that are really connected. And all the heavy lifting takes place in chapter 7, and all the fun stuff happens in chapter 8. I don't immediately go to chapter 8, and start reading the fun stuff just yet. I tell my couples, I say, look, I want to, I'm real big into communication as being the key to marriage lasting and and strengthening and lengthening. I I just want to work on communication with you. So we do a couple of things. The first two weeks we get together, and then over the next three or four weeks, we talk about the vows. And I mean, I excruciatingly go through every phrase of the vows of marriage with them. And I'm very traditional in the wedding ceremony that I do, use the dearly beloved we've gathered together, you know, and all this kind of stuff. The vows have such an intense meaning. But I think sometimes when we blow through these vows too quickly, people don't get it. And sometimes, if, if, when you attend a wedding, I don't know how much attention you're paying to the vows. I know most of you have said them in some form or fashion at some point, but still, does it remind you of the vows that you made? So I tell them, I say, we're going to do all the heavy lifting, and I'm going to ask you hard questions around these statements. And I want you to know when we stand before your family and your friends, and repeat these vows to each other, I want you to know what you're saying way better than anybody else in the room. Because no one else in the room has to say, I do, at the end. But you do. And so we'll do all the heavy lifting up front. And then when it gets time for the rehearsal and the wedding celebration itself, then we are nothing but party city. We are nothing but enjoying the day that the bride's mother has waited all the bride's life for. We are all about the celebration. That's what we're doing today. So I I wanted to put packages up there to remind you that there's a good thing coming, you just can't unwrap it yet. It's like Christmas packages sitting under the tree for two weeks before Christmas Day. And you know all your children have gone by and shaken them and poked them and lifted them to see what the content might be. And they've taken their x-ray scanners that they can buy, I'm sure, at Walmart now and and examined through the package trying to see what it is. The anticipation of something good inside. So all through the heavy lifting today, there's going to be packages up on the screen so that you're reminded that there's good stuff to come. We're going to read. In the fourth year of King Darius, 
The word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day in the ninth month, which is Chislev. Now, the town of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regmelech and their men to seek the favor of the Lord, speaking to the priests who belonged to the house of the Lord of armies and to the prophets, saying, Shall I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done these many years? Then the word of the Lord of the armies came to me, Zechariah, saying, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months, these seventy years, was it actually for me that you fasted? And when you eat and drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Are these not the words which the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and carefree along with its cities around it and the Negev and the foothills were inhabited? Whoa, stop right here. This is like two years after these visions that we've been talking about through the first six chapters of the book. So two years later, there was probably enough building on the temple, on the city, on the walls. Probably enough of that had gone on that there was actually a presence within the city of the temple-ish kind of thing and the priests kind of people. So much so that people outside sent representatives to Jerusalem to inquire of the priest because they knew they'd be there. So we're like two years later. I know, Bible time is just really compressed. You turn a page, it's been a few years. But before the exile, before the people were hauled off into captivity by Babylon, religious celebrations were joyous occasions. There was dancing and singing and sharing of food and inviting over the family and even the neighbors and even that guy down the street you didn't like. Everybody was welcome and there was just such a time. But the exile changed all that. The exile of the Jewish people put a veil of sorrow and weeping on the whole of religious life for the Jewish people. Laments. Remember the book of Lamentations? Laments replaced hymns and thanksgiving. And even to this day, if you go to Jerusalem, one of the sites that all the pilgrims will visit is the Wailing Wall. That just carries this thought of the lamenting even to the present day. I've been to the Wailing Wall I shared with our Bible study group this morning. I was blessed to be able to go and be in Israel a couple of times. And on my first trip over, as we toured around Jerusalem, went to the Wailing Wall, and there were groups of Jewish people, and the men go to this side, the women go to this side, and and they were just there wailing some. Some were singing. There's a few bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs going on down there because it's just a cool place to be. But they would always take their prayers and they would write their prayers on little pieces of paper and they would stick them in the cracks of the wall. I don't know whose job it was to come clean out the cracks every now and then because I can't imagine that they would just be overstuffed by now. But this idea of wailing and lamenting and all this had so ingrained itself in just 70 years of captivity. They actually had four major fastings that they would observe. And we'll see this again in the next chapter, so I'll give you a little hint. In chapter 8, verse 19, it mentions this fast and three others. But all four of these fasts are fasts of humiliation and prayer. They all commemorate a devastating event in the life of the Jewish people. There's one on the 10th month, and I'm doing these kind of more, not in an annual order, but in the order of the way events happened. In the 10th month, they would observe a fast because this was the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem. They would commemorate that day when Babylon set up outside of Jerusalem. And it was a long event. It didn't just happen overnight. But the beginning of the siege is, is remembered, not celebrated. 
with a fasting and a time of prayer in the tenth month. In the fourth month was when they began to break down the wall of Jerusalem. In the fourth month of the year, several years after the siege began, it was the fourth month of the year, so in the fourth month they would remember and they would fast, remembering how the walls, magnificent walls, that when they were completed, gave security to the city of God. When they began to be broken down. In the fifth month, this is the one that they came asking, shall I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done all these years? In the fifth month is when they would remember, commemorate the burning of the temple. And so, man, that was a, ooh, that was hard. Not only did they tear the walls down, but once they got inside, they destroyed everything they could, leaving no stone unturned, kind of. But they burned the temple. And so they remember that event in fasting and humiliation and prayer. And then in the seventh month, they also remembered the killing of Gedaliah. Gedaliah was the governor that Nebuchadnezzar put into place after he had deported all the people he was going to deport. And the only people left in Jerusalem and the surrounding area were people that he wasn't even going to worry about. They were the weakest, they were the sickest, they were the most non-threatening people. And so he left a governor in charge of them, and what did they do? They killed him, which pretty much sealed the fate of the Jewish nation in their exile. There was nothing to come back to. So they remember these four fasts, and they, they, they want to know, shall we keep doing what we've been doing? Is it enough? Is it right? And this was a can of worms that they, they opened up because in the crowd, when they brought this, one of the priests and one of the prophets there in the crowd that they addressed was this Zechariah guy. And he is not one to leave things alone. He's about to turn this simple question, should we continue to fast? is an examination of the heart of the Jewish nation. There's all kinds of fasts. Fasting is something that we in our culture and North American Christianity maybe don't observe very often. Some people do. You know, college students get behind these things and they think, oh, let's, let's fast. Let's fast once a week. Let's fast, every, let's, let's fast every month. Let's fast together over a weekend. Let's fast together forever. They just get so excited, they don't think it through. There's all kinds of fasts. Fasts of food is the one that we think about most often, but there's also fasting. You know, we have, we've invented new ways to fast. We fast from the internet now. Terry Mullins fasts from his games in the morning. You know, we, we fast from different things. Why? The reason behind a fast is to focus on the Lord, to worship the Lord, to pray and to seek Him, but also to celebrate, to worship Him. And what had happened in these 70 years is that fasting had turned into just a thing because it's a sad thing. Nobody likes to do sad things over and over. We get tired of doing sad things. And all they did was Oh, I'm miserable. Oh, I'm terrible. This is the day they started tearing down the wall. This is the day they burned the temple. This is the day that they killed the governor. This is the day, I think they would forget, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What if, let me just mess with the idea of fasting, and, and I'll use, for example, food. Because, again, it's the most common one we think of. And I'm not saying this is the way you have to do it. I'm just saying, let me just mess with the way you think about it. We think about fasting from food, and I'm going to eat nothing for a certain period of time, and we set a time limit. And through that time, we are supposed to, every time we get hungry, every time our little tummies rumble, something like that, that's to remind us, oh, I'm supposed to be praying about a thing 
a decision, an action, whatever. I'm supposed to be praying for my church. I'm supposed to be praying for my family. It's to remind me when I get hungry, when I drive by and I see the billboard for the, you know, big hamburger or something like that, I go, oh, oh no, I got to pray. Because it's supposed to motivate us to pray and to seek God. But you know, we, there's a little bit about, and I, this is just me, I'm sure, but there's a little bit about me that says, but I know where Five Guys is. And when I'm done with this, I'm going to get a double patty with lots of cheese and jalapenos and some grilled onions because I know where they are and that's mine to have. Or maybe it's like something, Mary Kay is like the queen of brownies and my college students known for far and wide her brownie powers and she's got this plate of brownies and I'm not supposed to eat them anyway, but I do. But she's got this plate of brownies and we just kind of set them over, you know, and I put things in front of them, you know, for two days, three days, I'm not going to eat brownies, whatever. But I know they're there. And I know where I'm going to be at the end of the fast. I'm going to break the fast, celebrate the Lord. Yay, God, we fasted. Let's all have brownies. What if, what if I fasted by taking the brownies and putting them in a nice bag and taking them down to the collegiate house on campus and said to my guys at the house, here, and left them. A, I either go back to Mary Kay and say, make more, or B, I'm realizing that my fast, it's something that I've put away for good. for the Lord. Sometimes, and, and I, I read, this is what sparked my thinking because I read this comment, when we feast the poor, then we truly fast ourselves. So if we give something that we've needed away, that we've wanted, when we give that away, we are truly fasting ourselves. We're not just postponing, but we're going to do without that thing. It's all about the heart. It's all about the heart of the matter. That's why we took time to celebrate the Lord's Supper first with reflection. It's all about the heart. So when they came and they said, you know, should we keep doing what we're doing? We might as well ask the question, should we just keep coming to church or not? Because what, did, what do we do when we come to church? What do we do when we gather like this? Should we just keep coming because this is our normal routine? What are we looking for when we come to church? So I, talked to, I, I, I thought about, let's, let's define serving. Who do you serve becomes the first question. Who are you serving when you do church? Are you serving God or are you serving yourself? The question was asked in the Scripture, when you fast, are you worshiping me or are you worshiping yourself? Aren't you just going to go eat again for yourself? Aren't you just going to go drink again for yourself? Do you worship me and you're eating again and you're drinking again? It's all about our heart before God. When we do church, is it just because we need to go someplace because we just need to relieve the tedium of the weekend? You know, let's just do something different. I've watched all the westerns I can watch on Saturday. Let me do something different in the morning. I'll go to church. I haven't seen Jim Souter all week. I haven't, you know, well, I did get to hang out with Harry some through the week this week. But I haven't seen some of you all all week. So I get to go to church and see my friends, see my family. Fellowship is a great thing. I am not against that at all. But is that why I come to church? Or am I coming for another reason? Is it just to hear something? You know, Ken tells terrible jokes, but I'm going to hear them so I can groan along with everyone else. Do I just want to hear what he's going to say next? Do I want to hear maybe a good idea? Do I want to hear something that I can use in conversation next week? Is that why I come to church? 
Or does doing church express the spirit of adoration, a coming to God? I would suggest, family, that when you get in the car, once you get seat belted and buckled in, once you get all the kids in place, whatever the routine is, before you come sometime Sunday morning, you do the same thing that maybe we did before the Lord's Supper. Lord, examine my heart. Am I ready to come and worship you? It's all about the heart. That's what we need to be about when we come to worship God. So it's not only who do you serve, but how do you serve? The problem is not lack of knowledge, but lack of obedience. One of the guys that I read this week said, without obedience and application, religious observance is meaningless. God doesn't want to recreate what was dead. He wants to breathe new life. He wants to breathe new life into what's new. 2021, this year of hope, this year that we have waited all last year for, thinking, man, January 1st, it's all going to be different. And it has been a little different so far. And some of it's good. But this year, 2021, is not going to be reached for the kingdom using yesterday's methods, using yesterday's dreams and visions, but looking forward, it's going to be new. Now, the the message, let let me clarify, the message is always going to be the same. The message is always going to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. But the methodologies are always going to be evolving, always going to be changing. And we always need to be ready for some of that. As as hard as we are about change, we have to stay plugged in. Sometimes I think we need to take our eyes off of what we currently see to allow our ears and our hearts to hear what God is saying. Jesus didn't call us to a fixed, singular method He left us with a dynamic global kingdom mission. I want to see us, I want to see us as a body talking about the global mission of God. Every time we think about go ye therefore, we need to also remember that other verse that says, first starting in Jerusalem. And then Judea, then Samaria, then to the other most parts. But I always want us to be thinking about all the parts. Not just get so focused on us in the church. And not even getting so focused on us in the neighborhood. But starting here and being faithful here. But also seeing other places. I like the slideshow this morning. Not the slideshow, the little video you did. Because I'm a disaster relief guy. I love going and chasing disasters. I don't really pray for the next disaster to happen, so I'll have something to do. But occasionally I start getting a little antsy and wondering, Lord, where are we going this year? Where are we going this season? North Carolina, Texas, Florida, went up to Iowa last year because of the wind that blew through there and leveled everything. I like to go in there with my chainsaw and tear stuff up. And I like to sit around and talk with the families in whose houses we're working. I like to take students. I like to take friends. I want to take you with me into Judea, around the state. Next time something happens close by and we can respond to it as a church. See, you just mentioned disasters. And the Lord provides. You who were not here to hear that on Facebook, something just fell apart. And I'm going to stand over here. (laughs) I want to involve you with reaching out and meeting the needs of people so that we can build the kingdom. There will be times when maybe we even take a trip and go somewhere across the country. Or even, as some of you have done, traveled outside the country 
into the uttermosts. We need to be about that as a church, okay? Oh, but Ken, we're so much smaller and things are so crazy. Yeah, I know. What a great opportunity. And for one thing, it's a lot easier to organize a small group of people than a large group of people. It's just easier. But I don't always want it to be easy, so we'll invite others. We'll involve others. But I want us to serve by going and doing. Culture will always change. His Word remains the same. It's only then, it's only right. There are forces afoot in our ceiling. It's only right then to believe that our ways of reaching and impacting culture with the good news of Christ must adapt as we go. Sometimes we need to grieve the past. Sometimes we need to say, oh, I just wish we could do that again. And you know what? That's okay to do that. It's sometimes healthy to grieve the way we used to do things. It's it's good to talk about it. It's not always good just to hang on so desperately you can't do anything else. Let me read the rest, beginning in verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, This is what the Lord of armies has said. Dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion, each to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor, and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. But they refused to pay attention and turned their stubborn shoulder and plugged their ears from hearing. They also made their hearts as hard as a diamond or flint, your translation may say, so that they could not hear the law and the words which the Lord of armies had sent by His Spirit through the former prophets. And therefore the great wrath came from the Lord of armies. And just as He called and they would not listen, so they called and I would not listen, says the Lord. But I scattered them with a storm wind among all the nations whom they did not know, so that the land was desolate behind them, so that no one went back and forth since they made the pleasant land desolate. Again, we're doing the heavy lifting. Look at the package. Next week, we unwrap. Who do you serve? How do you serve? Let's go on. When do you serve? I don't want to downplay the negative impact that this pandemic has had on our church and other churches. However, there are people in ministry and on mission who have said repeatedly that this pandemic has opened doors of ministry in ways that we have never previously experienced or imagined. Where one door closes, another door opens. There's always that silver lining. Any of these positive statements that you can remember, this pandemic has not outflanked the holy God that we worship. The church is called for such times like this. When do you serve? We're supposed to be the light in the darkness. There's darkness always. There always has been darkness. There always will be darkness. We have got a job that we can just work on with security because we're not going to run out until the Lord comes. The light of the world shines once and for all. But too often, we don't see the lost or the broken or the hurting among us because we're not looking for them. Too often, we don't see them because we're not looking for them. Dispense true justice, he says. Practice kindness and compassion each to the other. Don't oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. I don't have to explain what those mean. That's pretty plain, right? We just have to think of different methods to see that. How do we do justice? How do we express compassion? How do we not oppress? How do we relieve would be maybe a better way of saying that. How do we not devise evil, but devise good? I would like to devise some good against you. You okay with that? I would be. 
And I think that's what the kingdom is all about. We need to be devising good, not evil. It's easy to do evil. It's easy to let the little yin, 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 yin start. Because that doesn't hurt really. Yin, 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 yin. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does a lot. It's easy to oppress. Sometimes we're very aware of oppressing others. Sometimes we do it and we don't even know. And I want to have some conversations within our church body about these things. Just saying, look out. The when, when do we serve? The when is when the need is present. And not just when we have time or inclination or convenience. When do we serve? How do we serve? Who do we serve? And lastly, why do we serve? Here's a quote from a guy named David Ellis. Wrote in the New Layman's Bible Commentary, one of those big dusty books that you read. Here then is a concise yet comprehensive range of ethical teaching condensed into four pithy statements. Without attention to their importance, any fasting becomes a mere parade of ritualism, which, as the history of Judah has shown, can lead to moral and spiritual disaster. This is the way that you behaved back in the day, Jewish people. This is what you did back in the day. And the Lord came and warned you with the priests and the prophets and the teachings and all of this, and you wouldn't listen. And look what happened. His wrath rose up against you. Even to the point, I love that line in there, when I called on you, you didn't listen to me, so when you called on me, I didn't listen to you. You know, it doesn't seem like that's an attitude God would bring out very often, but He does. You didn't listen to me, guess what? I'm not going to listen to you. You think your prayers are not being heard by God? Have you been listening to what He's been saying? Ouch, Ken, leave me alone. You think things aren't going in your life? And I'm not saying that God's your good luck piece or anything like that, but I'm just saying I can't help but think that my life is going to be better when I'm listening to God and obeying God and doing God than when I'm ignoring God and turning my back to Him. Because even when things are hard in life, when I've got God right there with me, it's not as hard as it could be. And there's light on the horizon. When, where, how, all these questions. I think that here's the challenge that we need to remember. Because see, Zechariah may not have answered that original question. Hey, should we keep on fasting like we've been doing for the last 70 years? You know, we started this when things got bad, and now we're coming back home again. Do we have to keep doing this, or do we get to do something new or whatever? And he didn't just say yes, no. He didn't just answer that question directly. He just dove in. The lessons here are very clear to the people. Do not be like your unrepentant, unfaithful, disobedient, covenant-seeking, covenant-breaking ancestors. God looks at our inward heart before He looks on our exterior expression. Get your heart lined up with God. As an individual, as a family, we need our hearts lined up with God. And that's a constant, constant, constant effort on our part because our hearts are inherently dumb. I hope that doesn't show up on one of Brandon's quotes from the sermon. But our hearts are inherently slow, stupid, ignorant, and rebellious. And we constantly have to keep seeking after the Lord. At the end of Joshua, man, things are falling all over the place today. 
at the end of Joshua, he's reminding the people of the choice they get to make. He says in chapter 24, verse 15, I'll just read it to you. If it's disagreeable in our sight to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve, whether it's the gods of your fathers that they served when they were beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's always going to be the choice, people. There's always going to be the choice that we have to make. Who will you serve? The things from the past that weren't any good anyway, the things even surrounding us today where we are, which aren't any good anyway, or are you going to serve the Lord God creator of heaven and earth who loves you so much He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever, and that means whosoever, anybody, believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Here's an interesting fact that I'll begin to close up with. Change or die. This is the statement that some doctors have to make to their patients. Doctors give at-risk heart patients, and only one in seven of these patients will actually follow through with the changes that will save their life. One in seven. When the doctor says to you, Change or die, 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 change or die. Only one, one of those people is going to listen and actually change. Even when it's a matter of life or death, the ability to change remains the greatest challenge for most of us. Change or die. Given these odds, how can we make up, how can we reason, how can we ever think that we could make such changes within our own lives or within the life of this church with a program or a catchy theme? Choose this day. Examine your hearts. This is the heavy lifting, folks. This is the stuff that the prophet was telling the people because they needed to hear this before they get to the celebration. They needed to hear the gravity of what they're doing and what they're facing and what they're about to have to deal with. I'm just so excited about next week. There's some good stuff in there. Y'all come back. Don't read it before you get here. Let's just be surprised, like Christmas morning. Nah, go ahead and read it. It's all right. It's been out there a long time. It's no secret. We're going to see the heart of God and His plan next week. Like we haven't been seeing it all along, there is hope. In His salvation, there is hope in His judgment. There is hope in every aspect. Get a vision, get a word, whatever. There is hope in the Lord. All the people ought to say, come on, let's get a, let's get a little more fired up, folks. Let's, there is hope in the Lord, and we need to be pursuing that. And I'm not trying to like, you know, artificially produce excitement here. I'm just saying. You ought to get excited on Monday afternoon. You ought to get excited Tuesday while you're making breakfast. You ought to get excited Wednesday when you're wondering, gee, I wonder if we'll ever get back to Wednesday night prayer meeting or not. I hope ooh, that we can do something like that. You ought to get excited because God is God and He is not through yet. Look inside. He's already looking there, okay? Here's the secret. He's already looking there. So you might as well take a good look at what he's looking at. Might scare you, but it might motivate you. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all other names, the name in which life and breath 
were given again to us, the church. In the name of Jesus, Father, I humbly come before you and ask you, bear with us, be patient with us, don't not answer when we don't answer, Father. Come one more time. Help us examine our hearts individually. Help us to examine our motives individually. Help us to see what you see inside of us and help us to repent of those things which block us from you. Help us to learn to show kindness and love. Help us to not create evil in oppressing or gossiping or in any way ignoring. Help us to love you well and express that love well because there is a watching and waiting world to see what the church is going to be about. And they might might not even realize that's where the answer is, but that's okay, Father. We'll sneak up on them with you. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his fame.